Welcome everyone to this time of worship together. It's lectionary number 28, proper number 23, 18th Sunday after Pentecost, also better known for us as Sunday, October 9th, 2022. It's 47 degrees as I sit up in my back 40 here and uh, whew, chilly, but warm in our hearts as we come to worship our Lord. Our passage that we have for today is a beautiful one. The passage of the ten lepers and one who returns to give praise to Jesus. And what does that mean for us today? Um, what does it mean that only one out of ten came back? Or is that really where I should be focused at this point? Maybe there's something else going on in this story that we need to take a look at. Yeah, when we get to it, then we'll discuss it. Let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, your bountiful goodness fills all creation. Keep us safe from all that may hurt us, that whole and well in body and spirit, we may with grateful hearts accomplish all that you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from the second chapter of Kings, the fifth chapter. Naaman was general of the army under the king of Aram. He was important to his master, who held him in the highest esteem because it was by him that God had given victory to Aram, a truly great man but afflicted with a grievous skin disease. It so happened that Aram, on one of its raiding expeditions against Israel, captured a young girl who became a maid to Naaman's wife. One day she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of his skin disease. Naaman went straight to his master and reported what the girl from Israel had said. Well then, go, said the king of Aram, and I'll send a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. So he went off, taking with him about 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. Naaman delivered the letter to the king of Israel. The letter read, When you get this letter, you'll know that I've personally sent my servant Naaman to you. Heal him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he was terribly upset ripping his robe to pieces. He said, Am I a god with the power to bring death or life that I get orders to heal this man from his disease? What's going on here? That king's trying to pick a fight, that's what. Elisha, the man of God, heard what had happened, that the king of Israel was so distressed that he ripped his robe to shreds. He sent word to the king, why are you so upset, ripping your robe like this? Send him to me, so he'll learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman, with his horses and chariots, arrived in style and stopped at Elisha's door. Elisha sent out a servant to meet him with this message. Go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be as good as new. Naaman lost his temper. He turned on his heel saying, I thought he'd personally come on and meet me. Call on the name of God. Wave his hand over the disease spot and get rid of the disease. The Damascus rivers, Abana and Farfar, are cleaner by far than any of the rivers in Israel. Why not bathe in them? At least I get clean. He stomped off mad as a hornet. But his servants caught up with him and said, Father, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not let this simple wash and be clean? So he did it. He went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, following the orders of the holy man. His skin was healed, and it was like the skin of a little baby. He was as good as new. He then went back to the holy man. He and his entourage stood before him and said, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no God anywhere on earth other than the God of Israel. In gratitude, let me give you a gift. 
This ends the first lesson. Our second reading is from the second chapter of 2 Timothy. Fix this picture firmly in your mind. Jesus, descended from the line of David, raised from the dead. It's what you've heard from me all along. It's what I'm sitting in jail for right now. But God's word isn't in jail. That's why I stick it out here so that everyone God calls will get in on the salvation of Christ in all its glory. This is a sure thing. If we die with him, we'll live with him. If we stick it out with him, we'll rule with him. If we turn our backs on him, he'll turn his back on us. If we give up on him, he does not give up. For there's no way he can be false to himself. Repeat these basic essentials over and over to God's people. Warn them before God against pious nitpicking, which chip away, chips away at the faith. If it just wears everyone out, concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of, laying out the truth, plain and simple. Stay clear of pious talk that is only talk. Words are not mere words, you know. If they're not backed by a godly life, they accumulate as poison in the soul. Hymenicus and Philetus are examples, throwing believers off stride and missing the truth by a mile by saying the resurrection is over and done with. This ends the second lesson. And our gospel is recorded in the 17th chapter of Luke. It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance, but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. They went, and while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet so grateful, he couldn't thank him enough. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, Were not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, Get up, on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. The Gospel of the Lord. What an incredible story that is. It's a story of faith. It's a story of love. It's a story of Jesus' power over illness and even death. Yeah, we'll see that. But is that all there is to the story? Is it just another one of Jesus' healing stories that we, we read throughout the Gospels, especially here in the Gospel of Luke, and we say, wow, he was a pretty remarkable person, and why didn't more people come to believe in him and trust in him? Well, who knows? We just don't know why more didn't. But I think there's so much more to this story that we miss if we don't look at some of the finer details of the story. Um, think about it. Jesus is on his way toward Jerusalem. He's been on his way to Jerusalem for a long time now, ever since the beginning of this past summer. That's what we've been focusing in on. And it's going to be just a little while more until he's there. But we know what awaits him there in Jerusalem. And it's the cross. But he's going over this borderland between Samaria and Galilee. And that is not insignificant. Remember, the Samaritans and the Jews who lived in Galilee and south didn't get along whatsoever. You see, the people to the north, they were Jews as well. But, oh, they were considered half-breeds by the people down south. And why is that? Well, whenever they were taken over by Assyria... Israel to the south was still solid and united together and, and they didn't get into any alliances with the Assyrians that then later got them into trouble and, and had the north all taken over. No, down in the south, down in Judah land, they stayed firm. And it wasn't until much later that they were taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. But in the meantime, 
what happened up north was the people intermarried. The Jewish people intermarried with other um, nations, and they became what they considered down south as not pure Jews. They were, they used all kind of uh, bad language toward them, but called them dogs, called them half breeds. I mean, it just it was not a pleasant picture at all. So here's Jesus going toward Jerusalem, walking through this territory, and it's kind of a no man's land. I mean, who, where did you belong if you lived in this area? Well, you know, it was kind of, I, I got friends to the north, I got friends to the south, and but nobody likes each other, and oh, we don't know what's going on here. Kind of, um, kind of a weird place to be. And it's not weird that there are lepers there's leprosy everywhere and if you had leprosy you had to stay distant from anyone or else you made them unclean you also had a chance of spreading your leprosy to them as well so you you stood back and you said and you would shout out leper leper wherever you went so people would stay out of the way as well but these lepers see jesus they recognize who he is how can that be I mean, we just don't know. That's one detail that's left out of the story. But they recognize it, and they call him Master. That's significant. The only other people in this scripture, in this Gospel of Luke, that call Jesus Master are his disciples. They recognize who Jesus is. Interesting, isn't it? So... Did you notice how Jesus healed them? Um, he didn't. <laughs> At least not right away. He just told them, go show yourself to the priests. What? You just blowing them off, Jesus? No, he's not. Because by going, your, showing yourself to the priest, that is the place that you would be pronounced as being healed. That's the only place you could be pronounced as being healed. And once you went there... And the priest announced you healed. You could return back to society. You can even go back into the temple. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? It's fascinating that Jesus didn't heal them. It was while they were on the way to see the priest that they were healed. Oh yeah, Jesus had that healing. It was kind of like delayed action. Let's just see if you're going to do what I tell you to do. Hey, a little bit like the story of Naaman that we just had. Naaman, just dip yourself seven times in the Jordan. No, I'm not doing that. Come on, if he asked you to jump off a cliff, would you do that? Well, yeah. Well, then just do this. And he did, and he was healed. The same with these three. They were on their way to see the priest. Now, we don't know what happened to the other nine. Our assumption is they went on to show themselves to the priest so that they could be declared healed and they could return to society. But one of them didn't. One of them ran back to Jesus and fell at his feet. He's praising God. And if you're falling at your feet in front of Jesus, you're praising Jesus. You're, you're thanking Jesus for what he did. Whatever kind of magic he, he worked out, whatever kind of healing power that, well, maybe this is the healing power we've heard about all along, he's thinking. Because remember, all these um, um, lepers, they called out to him, Master Jesus. They knew who he was and what he was doing. Now it was happening to them. But only one returned. And Jesus lets us know who that one was. He was different from the others. The others were Jews from the south. This one, he used the word, our, our scripture said outsider. The exact word is foreigner. And this is the only place in the Gospels this word occurs. But it does occur in a very openly visible place for every single Jew who would go to the temple. Once you enter into the temple courtyard and into the temple, there was a, a certain barrier in there. That's as far as the women, the children, and the outsiders, the foreigners were allowed to go. The actual word is foreigners. That was as far as they were allowed to go. No foreigners beyond this line. Only the adult men the Jewish men were allowed to go in a little bit further. And then even then, they couldn't cross a certain barrier because that was only reserved for the priests. And then there's one spot that only the high priest could go into. You see, uh, it's kind of a crazy thing, but that's the way things were. Jesus said, why is there only this foreigner who's here? 
Now, remember I said it seems like a pretty straightforward kind of healing, and I do believe they were all healed. It doesn't hit anywhere say that Jesus took back the healing from the other nine. No, they were healed. They obeyed Jesus. They went to see the priests. But what about the one? And what, what really is, is kind of going on here? Okay, there's a lot of emphasis on the fact that this was between Galilee and Samaria and this foreigner. Well, obviously he was from Samaria. The Gospel of Luke talks time and time and time again about Samaria, how it is the place where, where people come to realize who Jesus is outside of the insiders, right? The outsiders, they realize who Jesus is and they experience his love and his life and his healing. Um, it's not just the foreigners as far as where they live. It's also foreigners in the sense of um, people who are sick, lepers, those who are ill. They recognize who Jesus is and Jesus heals them. He's constantly healing those outside of the boundaries of Judaism. Basically, what he's saying is, don't think that because you profess God as your Lord, that you have an inside track on salvation. Because, no, it's not just for you, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. And I think that's something we need to realize, that there are those who live on the fringes, who've been pushed away. Maybe even we do that amongst ourselves as Christians, you know, we say, oh, well, we believe the right way and they don't believe the right way. So we're just going to kind of shove them off to the side and, and hope that maybe God in his mercy will take them in. Oh, are you kidding? God has taken them in. God has taken every single person in who has shouted out to him, Jesus, master, Jesus, master. How do you like how this ends? He says to him, get up on your way your faith has healed and saved you. Really, it's just one word there, but our English translation here uses both healed and saved for the one word because it means both of those things. They are now well and whole again. They can return to society. They're not the untouchables anymore. And God has saved him. God has saved us. It is salvation. It is peace. It is wholeness. It is wellness. It's all those things that are now, now ours in Christ. And did, did you see what the leper did? He knelt down and gave praise and thanks to Jesus. He knelt down in gratitude. That word gratitude is the same word that we get our term for Eucharist, which is Holy Communion. Every time you and I partake of that bread and that wine and we remember Christ's um, body and his blood, his love and his grace poured out for us, every time we do that, we are showing our gratitude, our gratitude to what God has done for us and our gratitude for him providing us with this simple meal, a meal that yells out to us, I love you. I love you. Well, that's what this leper heard. He heard, Jesus loves me. Hopefully today and every day, you and I hear those same words and we return to give thanks to our God of love, our God of grace, our God of forgiveness. Amen. Let's now join together in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for bishops, pastors, and deacons. Inspire leaders of the church to proclaim your mighty deeds that your saving faith may be known to all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Majestic God, we give you thanks for land and water, seed time and harvest. Break down boundaries we construct between ourselves and the rest of your creation. Bring renewal and restoration to places affected by pollution and deforestation. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Mighty God, we give you thanks for those in our community, nation, and world who work for justice and peace. 
guide those who govern to act on behalf of those marginalized by race, ethnicity, or religion. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, we give you thanks that you hear the cries of those in need, restore to community those who are stigmatized by illness, feel rejected, or who live in isolation. Send healing to all who suffer. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Faithful God, we give you thanks for the healing ministries of this congregation. Equip those who visit, care, and pray for the sick. Give insight to doctors, nurses, home health aides, and all practitioners of medicinal arts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us to your glory. Renew our trust in your eternal promise of mercy, redemption, and new life. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. It's cool, it's breezy, mid-40s right now, but you know, autumn is here. And so is football. And I know you, who you all will know, the team I'll be rooting for this weekend. But I'll tell you, it's going to be one wild and crazy football season. So go Steelers and go Bills. God's blessings be with you.